Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, would I take this opportunity to uh, call this seminar to order? Um, I have the privilege of uh, uh, directing this uh, afternoon's uh, discussion. Uh, my name is uh, George Gona from the Department of History and Archaeology. Um, I welcome you uh, this afternoon and uh, we'll have a great uh, deliberation. Um, this has been uh, a series of seminars that we've uh, held in the department the last uh, almost two years now. And um, we have this afternoon um, a PhD student, uh, Elena Oswald from Humboldt um, University Berlin, uh, presenting a paper titled Reexamining Settler State and Colonial Mobility. Um, Elena is um, uh, a student, a PhD student in this university. Uh, just to give a little background of Elena's uh, uh, career in academics, she did her BA at the Free University of Berlin in political science, and she has told me that uh, after you know doing a soul searching, she realized uh, she wasn't for political science, so she decided to venture into African studies and finally uh, history. So she did have MA in African studies at um, uh, Humboldt University, uh, particularly with a focus of, uh, in history and, uh, and Kiswahili. Uh, she had a small uh, short-term instinct at, um, a visit at the University of Dar es Salaam uh, for an, one exchange seminar. Uh, since 2019, uh, she has been uh, carrying out uh, uh, research, a PhD research uh, which is titled Automobility in 20th Century, Kenya as a focus uh, uh, with a, a particular interest in the, the Nyanza and, uh, and the coast. Uh, today, um, Elena is gonna speak to us uh, about uh, examining settler state. Um, what she's gonna do in the first instance will be to give an overview of her PhD work uh, and then she will delve into uh, discussing the topic uh, of uh, interest uh, uh, this afternoon. Um, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to welcome you, Alina. Thank you so much, Dr. Gona. Um, so yeah, good, good afternoon. Abari Samchana. Irionade. Okay, I, I tried. Uh, <laughs> Ario Maber. Um, my name is Alina Oswald, as Dr. Gona has just said. And um, yes, I'm a PhD student in the Department of African Studies at the Humboldt University in Berlin. Um, and my dissertation project is supervised by Professor Bas de Kock, who some at the uh, department might have heard of. He's also going to teach. Um, in the next semester. Um, I received funding in 2019, um, uh, but I was delayed um, by the global COVID pandemic, um, hopefully finishing up my project um, late in this year. Uh, since last October, I've been a research affiliate here at the Department of History and Archaeology, not for the first time. So I'm grateful to uh, Dr. Ombongi for having me here again. And I'm very honored to present my PhD project and a particular paper today within this esteemed format. Thank you, Dr. Ombongi. And indeed, a special thanks to all the lecturers and students, as well as other attendants who make this seminar, in my experience, such a productive, critical, but also congenial place to disseminate and discuss ongoing research. I will start off by saying a few words about how I came to my dissertation topic, why I believe automobility is a relevant topic, 
um, before speaking about my dissertation more broadly. And in the second part, I'm going to turn to my paper, which is entitled Re-examining the Settler State and Colonial Mobility. And it is a case study of automobility in the 1920s to 1950s Nyanza in Western Kenya. Um, it was an exchange semester, the exchange semester that Dr. Gona just mentioned at the University of Dar es Salaam that got me interested in transport history. Professor Yusuf Ulawi, a lecturer there, tasked us to do a mini research project by applying oral history methods. And while commuting to the university, I had seen some mini bus operators wearing vests with the print Umoja Vadereva Nama Conducta Dar es Salaam. So an association of drivers and conductors. This interested me, and I tried to find out more on the history of the workers and also of the organization, workers who are working for the owners of the minibuses called Dala Dala that are privately owned and are often viewed as relatively powerless. Uh, I quickly also found Matteo Rizzo's work on minibus labor in Dar es Salaam. He analyzes it from a political e economy angle. And inspired by that, I looked at some at a somewhat more tumultuous history of Matatu workers in Nairobi from the 1980s in my master's thesis. A special focus of my MA thesis was the Public Transport Union, short PUTON, a union that could finally be registered in 2013 after the new constitution came in. The union is based in Kariobangi and is made up of Matatu workers from that side of Nairobi. Joe and Diritu, the chairman and the members, have worked hard to improve working conditions and service delivery. The relevant state institutions are, however, often more concerned with getting rid of the Matatu altogether uh, or facilitating movement uh, of more privileged car owners, like in the case of the expressway. Sometimes there's also talk of replacing the Matatu with a rapid transit system. While doing this research in 2016, I met Dr. Gona, who is my discussant here today. Um, he was so kind to share some of his extensive expertise on trade units with me. And he also provided me with his doctoral thesis, Workers and the Struggles for Democracy in Kenya, which shaped my thinking around trade unions in the Moi era, structural adjustment, and the fight of Kenyans for the reintroduction of multi-party democracy. But why, I am, but why am I working on automobility history more broadly now? When I thought about this yesterday, I thought about how I grew up in the Southwest of Germany, in a region that can only be described as car-centered. The main city is Stuttgart, where Mercedes-Benz is headquartered and Porsche's headquarters is located not far away from there. This part of Germany, had previously been called the poor house of the Republic, and it had been characterized by a rather poor peasant society up until at least the 1800s. The car industry there started to really boom after the Second World War, and it transformed the region into one dominated by the automotive and supply industries. They are one of the main employers. On the next slide, you will see the uh, former train station with a rotating Mercedes symbol on top of it. Um, so when I grew up there, it was in a very middle-class environment. Almost every family had two cars, one for each parent. They were used for commuting to work, for bringing children to music lessons or football and so on. Usually when one of my friends turned 18, they too would get their own car. One of the problems in many of the streets of my village is to find space to park these cars. Not everyone has an underground car park, though some have built them for exactly that reason. And in 1990, a bypass road was built to divert traffic from the village. Um, and people had become conscious of pollution and, and such things and you know houses, you could see the effect of pollution. So when the bypass road was, was opened, um, at first everyone was happy. Many vehicle drivers were now circumventing the village, but nasty accidents happened too 
because the bypass road allowed for higher speed. Some of the ones I remember were very sad. Then, after some years, traffic through the village increased again, and traffic jams started to form. They also formed at the point where the bypass road ended and joined a pre-existing road. So the people in conjunction with the road authority thought, let's extend and widen the bypass road. They hoped they could ease the congestion. After a couple of years, induced demand set in again, meaning more car drivers decided to use their cars on that very particular road. And soon there were traffic jams again during rush hour and actually both on a bypass and on the old road in the village. Over roughly the same period of time, 30 years, the public transport system was barely improved. It is true that in 1999, a train track was revived, but taken together, the bus and the train gave you two options of getting out of or into the village per hour, into the main two directions. You could really forget about getting anywhere else. Um, and also, you couldn't really do that on weekends because it would be fewer, fewer uh, options. Um, mostly people with lower income were reliant on this transport system. So even if my dissertation is on automobility in Kenya, I think that this is where the relevance of automobility histories lie, lies. It is relevant because motor vehicles shape how we live in our communities and they shape our planet and has shaped experiences but it has shaped experiences and environments unevenly. So the bigger questions are, who moves how on a global scale? Whose comfort is prioritized? What does automobility do to our environment? Can we change how automobility is assembled? Pollution from motor vehicles in the global north have contributed significantly to climate change. Raw materials used in automobility including batteries in electric cars, of course, also fuel, are often exploited in the global south. Let us think for a moment about the planned oil extraction at Lake Albert and the East Africa crude oil pipeline from Hoima, Uganda to the Tanzanian coast with its almost 1,500 kilometers of oil pipeline through East Africa. I was at a conference last month where historian Gabriel Hecht was going a bit deeper with this extraction example, showing how these extractive companies and large scale projects are often promising jobs, but displace people from their homes, destroy the environment and deplete resources. If, if you haven't heard of Gabrielle Hecht, here are just two of her works that will refer to her later again. If you want to seriously engage with these social and environmental questions of today that are shaped by colonialism and other factors, Mimi Scheller's mobility justice is a good start. Um, as a sociologist, she has co-founded the New Mobility Studies. Much of her work, also with John Uri, has been groundbreaking but I'm also convinced we need historians to understand how we got to this point. Okay, I can go back. Um, technology and mobility history teaches us that we can change the interlinkages between ourselves, the society, and the technology and build new transport systems. There are important differences of how societies use motor vehicles, and they don't only differ on a national scale, but often on a regional one. Motor vehicles are integrated deeply in our societies and culture and impacted by our natural environment. Even technologies that might seem neutral and universal are, as Madeleine Akres has demonstrated, translated to fit a local context and people continue to adapt them to fit. So to return to my doctoral project, I'm centering on African and racialized others' mobilities in coastal and Western Kenya. Mombasa in the coast, Kisumu and Nyanza. In 1901, these two regions were connected by the railway, which some have com commented brought about modern Kenya. The dissertation focuses on the transport infrastructure, spatial mobilities, automotive and transport work, and politics of transport. 
Could you go back one slide, please? Thank you. I'm relating automobility to the colonial railway here because the railway can be understood as what Brian Larkin called the colonial sublime. For the British, the Uganda Railway legitimized to some extent their rule by demonstrating their alleged superiority. On the other hand, as we all know, the railway was not just a symbol, but it was a de facto tool of economic exploitation and control. One that was transporting resources out of East Africa and uh, used it as a marketplace for goods from Europe. The railway was also an attempt to direct and control African mobilities. The road infrastructure, often financed as a tool of control over the surrounding regions, served to sub subdue, direct, or discipline local communities. Roads were also essential to both colonial and post-colonial statecraft. The road construction was a reordering of environment and society, impacting on animal and human immobilities and mobilities, as well as preceding land use change, for instance, by the, with the drainage of swamps or deforestation. And yet the 20th century roads even if mostly built for extractive reasons or for white settlers, became a slightly less controlled and segregated infrastructure, important for Africans and other racialized groups. I will talk about this a bit later in the second part. Road transport of goods and passengers, often mixed, was so popular and outside of the colonial control, already in the interwar years, that British officials and railway experts raised alarm about the competition to the railway. While we speak about this supposedly new road infrastructure, I want to just shortly stress that East Africa already had a sophisticated new, uh, a sophisticated walking infrastructure. Roads, rest places, ferries, and bridges ingeniously made from local materials. Apart from more normal roads for walking, there were also the caravan highways of the Indian Ocean trade that enabled mass transit of often more than 100 porters at the same time. You might have come across this bridge infrastructure here on the next slide. It is an intricate suspension bridge in Western Kenya called Omufunje. It was made of vines and plant material. It spanned the very wide river in Zoia, in Mumias, and was made by a specific group of the Wanga people. On another photo, we can see a car caravan porters using the bridge. But this was not the only technology. If we just stay in Western Kenya, there was also the Obulalo, or the Oulalo, that was infrastructure for crossing rivers as much as it was able to catch andrometric fish with its inbuilt traps. For multiple reasons, however, the British wanted a new transport system. The first set of new roads that they had had built with local labor knowledge and skill were largely superseding previous roads. Later, the colonial road infrastructure was built by coercing Africans to work, and it was financed partially to a significant part uh, from African taxes. The construction and maintenance served two purposes. It was thought to discipline Africans and create a workforce, while at the same time it strengthened indirect rule. It was the newly appointed chiefs and headmen who had to turn out people to perform road work. This is echoing what Gabriel Hecht calls a technopolitical regime. Politics are contained in the technology itself. The fact that the roads were built with minimal investment meant that with every rainy season, workers had to reconstruct the roads and bridges as communal work. In his recent book, Joshua Kreis has called this phenomenon the impermanence of the road. The roads were intentionally bad so that workers could be mobilized and used in repair work. The regularity of this road work exercised control over chiefs and chiefs in turn 
exercise control over their people. Typically, those who had to turn out to do this work were of lower standing within the community. Tanzanian historian Frank Edwards recently added to this understanding of impermanence an article called Planned Vulnerabilities, in which he examined colonial roads and drainage in Dar es Salaam. And before I end this excursion into roads, bridges, and work, I want to stress that the infrastructure itself was critical. This is a concept developed by historians of technology. Yes, it facilitated easier tax collection and control, but it also offered a site for local communities to resist. It was mutable. The infrastructure itself, its travelers and their goods were often attacked. Archival documents and reports are full of those incidents. And this criticality of infrastructure for statecraft, economic exploitation, but also for resistance remained important post-independence as well. For Kenya, studies on infrastructure and automobility are not new. Most of them are, however, set in post-independence Kenya. There is, for instance, Kenda Mutongi's beautifully written Matatu, which you can see here on the left, in which he examines Nairobi's minibus transport. An earlier example is Mbugwa wa Mugai's Matatu Men, which is concerned with the Nairobi Matatu culture and notions of masculinity. Jacqueline Klopp, Malekitze de Kayesi, as well as UON's very own Professor Winnie Mitula and colleagues have looked at urban planning, transport planning, and other aspects of transport in Kenya. There is also exciting work from an anthropology angle by Nick Carrier, Mark Lamont, and more recently, Amiel Bis. However, for the colonial period, not much has been published. The pioneer of transport history, Gordon Pyre, has written on automobility of white settlers and tourists. The only two who wrote about South Asian and African motor transporters in this earlier period are Robert Gregory with his monography in 1993 and historian Gordon Omenia from Kenyatta University. So my project seeks to fill a gap by looking at the long durée of automobility. One inspiration for me was Jennifer Hart's Ghana on the go. And I agree with her that in Kenya too, Africans generated alternative possibilities for political and economic participation and social inclusion very early in the colonial period. Yet the biggest difference between her case study in Ghana and Kenya is that Kenya became a settler state. Some of the key questions I'm asking my project are, who financed and worked on the colonial roads? Who used those roads for what purposes? Who traveled how? In which ways does automobility draw on previous forms of mobilities and culture? What effects had the infrastructure and the environment on the transport delivery? Which intersectional issues are at play? Which networks are transformed by the more frequent use of motor vehicles? What regional differences exist in automobility? whose skills are recognized and whose mobility is valued. I will now zoom in on a case study set in 1920s to 1950s Nyanza, particularly central and north Nyanza. It is perhaps a micro history. I will talk about the emerging automobility and intersectional aspects of it. That means I pay attention to how race, gender and class shaped it. My historical actors are mostly Africans from the region, but I also speak about arrivals. And under that somewhat clunky term, arrivals, I subsume people who had migrated from different parts of Asia to East Africa, mostly in the second half of the 19th century. In the wider project, this includes people from modern day India, Pakistan, Hadramaut, from Oman, but in this case study, the arrivals are mostly from the region of Gujarat in what is today India. Method method methodically, this paper is based on the analysis of interviews and archival material. And there's also reference made to a novel by Chris Ogot. In the doctoral project, I also use media reports, songs, 
and novels. Now a quick disclaimer. I wouldn't have been able to conduct this research without um, my recent Erasmus Plus and IFRA grant, and without many people who either connected me to interviewees, answered my emails to set up meetings, or acted as interpreters in interviews. I also want to thank my Doluo teacher, who ensured that I don't mispronounce absolutely every word. And generally, this research is not a finished product, but a work in progress. So I'm looking forward to your feedback. All right. So this study is concerned with mobilities and particularly automobilities. I have mentioned my region, regional focus already. Here you can now see it on a roadmap, originally from 1927. You can see the area on a roadmap, oh yes. The aim of my paper is to add to the themes of colonial mobility and settler state, as they have emerged from a special issue in mobilities um, in January, 2022. In their introduction, the editors Genevieve Carpio, Nachi Blueburn, and Laura Baraklov explain that they are heeding Georgine Clarison's call to work on mobilities and settler colonialism outside of Australasia. A pioneer of the new mobility history, Georgine Clarison has provided thought-provoking studies of automobilities. The special issue adds case studies from the United States of America, Canada, and Israel to the existing research. Former European settler colonies on the African continent, however, remain curiously absent. Nonetheless, Carpio and co-editors sharpen the research agenda of the new mobility studies by instituting principles for the engagement with colonial mobilities, which are compatible for research on African regions. This study follows their principle by attempting to foreground indigenous histories and perspectives including indigenous homelands and struggles, and deliberating about the relations between settlers, indigenous and racialized others. The group of racialized others is generally important as the presence of labor migrants, enslaved people or refugees often threatened or at least complicated the colonial order. In the following, this study uses Africans instead of indigenous people. There is a decision I made to include various groups found in East Africa before the British conquest, many of whom had moved from one region to another region in the previous centuries. The Luo, who are central to this study, started moving into the area of Nyanza from the 1500s onwards. Central to Carpio and colleagues' agenda is the concept of mobility sovereignty, which is defined as the ability to choose when, how, and for what purpose to engage in movement. This concept is also linked to mobility justice, understood by Mimichella as a set of processes, processes through which unequal spatial conditions and differential subjects are made. The first process, being situated in a deliberative phase um, is where it means that there needs to be a recognition of the direct and indirect vulnerabilities of different community members vis-a-vis -vis transport infrastructures and their mobilities. Secondly, those who are possibly affected require access to information, space for the creation of community-based knowledge creation, and an approval of the mobilities rooted in local knowledge. The third process relates to restorative justice, based on injustices such as slavery, climate change, but also colonialism. In the historiography of Africa, settler colonialism has been an important concept, which underwent drastic historiographical shifts in the second half of the 20th century, as Lorenzo Verazzini outlined. While the compound term settler colonialism became central to analyses from the late 1960s, 
it has rarely been linked to the differentiated mobilities it intended. The first part of my paper thus re-examines settler state and colonial mobility in the Kenyan context. In the second and empirical part, the study addresses the structures and processes that enabled and controlled automobility, as well as the relationships and strategies employed by non-white transporters. The concluding part is centered on the differentiated automobilities of racialized individuals and invites further thoughts on what can be gleaned from these concepts. This study draws on archival material access between January 2019 and now in various archives in Kenya, England, and online. It is also based on 10 interviews I conducted in Kenya between April 2021 and last Thursday. And additionally, um, I received two summaries of interviews um, by Stephen Oguda Odwar. Um, I had spoken to him about my research interest and he then conducted two interviews with older relatives when researching his own family history. And based on his write-ups, I then went and conducted two in-depth interviews with him and with his two interviewees. So was Kenya a settler state? There is no consensus amongst scholars of Kenyan history whether the colony was indeed a settler state before it became independent from Britain in 1963. Two main strands opposed such a terminology. The first strand analyzed settlers and colonialism as separate from each other. In the 1970s, E.S. Atieno Odiambo investigated the settler political economy and argued that white settlers had strong support from, from the colonial state and considerable influence over it, but he did not connect settlers to colonialism as such. This was in line with the historiographical trend at the time, but on the, one, on the other hand, the reluctance also seems to stem from the tacit assumption that in a settler state, the settlers would eventually replace the people who had previously lived in its confines. In Kenya, white settlers required Africans to work on the very land that the settlers in conjunction with the colonial administration had alienated. In the region under consideration here in North and Central Nyanza, there were few white settlers. The annual re provincial report for 1921 listed 236 Europeans, 51 of whom lived in the Northern district. At the same time, 1,803 Asian residents or other residents are listed, 170 of whom are reported in the Northern district. Altogether, the African population is given as 566,357, with a majority living in North Nyanza, 290,174. While the European and other population increase, so did Africans who remained always in the clear majority. A second argument was brought forward by Robert Maxson. He opined that Kenya was never a settler state because the colonial administration adopted African paramountcy as a doctrine from circa 1923. The closest Kenya had been to a settler state, he argued, was under Edward Northey, who became governor of Kenya in early 1919. Northey immediately set out to attend to white settlers' demands. Under him, African men over 16 years of age had to register with the local authorities and carry identification documents called Vipande in Kiswahili. The Vipande had to be shown to the colonial police upon request, but also to employers. Northey made sure that the government of the territory he, re he renamed Kenya also helped white settlers in recruiting African labor a practice that was previously instituted during World War I. The colonial office eventually fired Northey in mid-1922 after a wave of protest against him from African Indian and British groups. After his sacking, even if Africans were considered important on some rather abstract political level, this translated to no significant changes on the ground as the legislation introduced under Northey remained intact. We will look at that in a moment. 
Historians Caroline Elkins and Susan Peterson viewed Kenya differently. They defined four groups which determined 20th century settler colonialism in their view. The imperial metropole, the local administration, indigenous population, and the often demanding and well-connected settler community who enjoyed particular privileges. Privileges were rights to own land, vote, or to be tried according to metropolitan standards of justice. Elkins and Peterson then ranked colonial Kenya as high in its level of settler incorporation into government and as relatively high in its institutionalization of settler privilege in law and economic activities. While this study endorses the Elkins-Peterson concept, it also adds, like Carpio and colleagues, colleagues suggested, the group of racialized others to whom I refer as arrivals. Furthermore, I stress that mobilities are a defining dimension of the Kenyan settler state. In the words of Georgine Clarkson, settler colonial societies are, after all, stridently mobile formations. So what legislation governed colonial mobilities in 1920s, 1950s Kenya? From the onset of their settlement, white Europeans or South Africans were able to travel within colonial Kenya as they wished without being asked questions. The only exemption was the Northern Frontier District for which they had to obtain a permit as it was closed off and governed by the military. Far from being immobile, white settlers roamed for pleasure through Kenya and many were regularly visiting regional centers or the colonial capital meeting fellow settlers in whites only members clubs. Moreover, the Brits returned seasonally to the metropole and this mobility practice secured the relationship with England, with Great Britain, where they often sent their children for schooling. While white settlers enjoyed immense mobility sovereignty, the colonial administration simultaneously managed the mobilities of racialized people seeking to fix them in space or create predictable mobilities based on the labor demands of the settlers and the colonial enterprises. Within a period under investigation, Africans were obliged to reside in what was defined as their home areas, reserves, or at their workplace, whether that was a white settler's farm or household, a plantation, or another location of their casual and waged employment. Spatial mobilities were mainly regulated by four laws in this period, as David Anderson has shown, the Master and Servant Ordinance of 1906, modeled after similar legislation in the Gold Coast and Transvaal, introduced draconian punishment for various offenses. The first law addressed workers leaving their workplace on their own accord without seeking permission. This so-called desertion of employment was punishable by a maximum of two months imprisonment or a fine of two wages. In 1910, the law was amended and specified that those regulated were Africans and Arabs. During World War I, the penalties for desertion were further increased and the police was now allowed to make arrests without warrants. When the Supreme Court nullified the Master and Servants Ordinance in 1923, it was quickly replaced by another ordinance on the behest of the settler community, which echoed the previous provisions. Secondly, in 1920, we spoke about this already, Northey enacted the Registration of Natives Ordinance of 1915 based on the Vipanda, which constrained the workers' freedom of mobility decisively. Any African leaving employment without a proper notice could now be identified by the passbook that he was required to carry. The third law was the Registration of Domestic Servants Ordinance of 1926. Herein, African domestic workers were prevented from moving to another European employer unless they had a positive reference from the previous employer. This was done via a so-called labor permit. Lastly, from 1927, Kisumu and other urban areas introduced township rules to regulate African vagrancy and crime in the city. Africans were prohibited from living outside of allocated zones and mostly banned from entering other neighborhoods unless working in arrivals or European households. In Ianza, most of the legislation constraining non-white mobilities was applied only to Africans or Arabs. 
and it was done so in the context of labor questions. Africans had been mobilized to work by taxation, which was already three rupees per hut by 1903. Eventually, when payment in kind was no longer allowed, men started leaving to earn money. The majority of immigrants from the Indian subcontinent came to Kenya for the construction of the Uganda Railway. With the help of South Asian merchants who had been active in the Indian Ocean trade, nearly 40,000 indentured workers were received between 1895 and 1903. It is estimated that between 7,300 and 13,000 railway workers stayed in Kenya, most of whom found work as skilled or semi-skilled workers at the railways and in other businesses. Some bolstered the already existing trading network, becoming small-scale traders, while a few started to work agricultural land, for example, in Muhoroni or Kibos, not far from Kisumu. In Kisumu itself, Asians were the key traders and industrialists, who at any point outnumbered Europeans by far. While Kisumu were separated in different zones, only Africans were truly segregated unless they worked and lived in other zones, while Asians were living in the same zone as Europeans. So let's turn now to the structures and processes of automobilities in Nyanza. In regards to driving motor vehicles, so-called certificates of competency were issued by persons appointed by the governor. Whoever sat in a vehicle with a certified driver was also allowed to drive. Any magistrate or police officer from the rank of an inspector could check those driving for their certificates. Additionally, owners of motor vehicles needed to obtain a motor vehicle license, which had to be renewed regularly. In 1920s Kisumu, this fell under the duties of the superintendent of police. From 1937, the Transport Licensing Ordinance instituted a Trans Transport Licensing Board, TLB, which coordinated and controlled transport in the colony. Generally, the boards only convened twice a year. The board only convened twice a year, issuing one of four different licenses to owners of motor vehicles, from higher end reward services to uh, a separate license for goods to the road service license for professional transporters of goods and passengers. In this system, the prospective transporter needed the approval of the district commissioner and who advised the licensing board on application. Africans protested decisions, but it was only in 1946 that Walter Odede joined the Nyanza board as its first African member. This and the simplification of process of appeal made it possible for more Africans to become licensed. The urban motor transport up until the 1930s was in most of the colony in the hands of British owned transport companies, while officials were generally skeptical of any involvement of racialized others in the sector. However, especially when inter-regional transport emerged from the 1930s, it was predominantly traders of Asian descent, arrivals, who operated refitted lorries or buses for goods and passenger transport. At this point, white residents in Kenya fled to their private cars, not using the interregional buses or even urban buses that were originally created for them in Nairobi and Mombasa. And therewith, I'm going to zoom in on Kenya Mord bus and how this form of transport was assembled in Nyanza. In reports by the colonial administration, there are statistics on motor transport and ownership from the mid 1920s, but unfortunately, they lack important details on who the African vehicle owners were. In 1927, there were allegedly 27 lorries or buses plying between Kisumu and other settlements in central and south Nyanza owned by African individuals or companies. Additionally, there were 10 African-owned cars and eight lorries in north Nyanza. One year later, 14 African-owned lorries were apparently plying the Kisumu-Yala road alone. Traveling on this very road 
in the late 1920s and 1930s would have led to a small village called Simenia, 15 kilometers past Yala. Simenia in Ziaia is not just situated on the road, but stretches out on the roadside over hilly landscape, leading down to a stream that has formed a small valley. This is where the houses of the wider family of Nashon Ongewe, son of Omolo, were and still are today. A little further on the road is in Zoia, in Ugenia, which during this period was an important marketplace where the Luo, Tezo, and other people would meet and trade. Branching off before on Zoia was a road which led to the border of Uganda at Busia. The route from Nzoia to Kisumu and the route from Busia to Kitale um, would become serviced by Nashon's buses. So you can see if you're close enough, a couple of um, places I've been speaking about here. And there's the area of Sidindi Simbenya, um, which is uh, where I put the cross. And then you can see the river Nzoia in blue, um, Yala, and then uh, towards the bottom right, Kisumu. Um, so the only historian who seriously engaged with the question who these African transporters or also Asian transporters in the 1930s Nyanza were, Robert Gregory mentions that National Ngewe was the only African amongst South Asians and Arabs, both. Nashon's bus company became known as Kanya Mord Bus. It is said that the bus company came into being with the help of a chief son called William Ombala, son of Oguda. William had been educated in Maseno school and worked from 1925 for the Uganda Railway. He was posted to Kisumu as a deputy station master, speaking Doluo, Kiswahili, English, and a few words of Gujarati. Having become acquainted with Nyanza-based traders of South Asian descent, he was encouraged by them to buy a motor vehicle to carry people from his home in Simenia and Sidindi to the railway station in Kisumu. At that time, it was a journey of about 40 miles. William involved his family in this question and together they declared in 1928 to buy a lorry for passengers and goods transport. A relative of Williams by the name of Nashon Ongewe had acquired driving skills working for a man named Nurali in Nairobi, probably as a turn boy and driver. Turn boys usually worked at transport companies, loading the vehicles, parking them or fixing them when they broke down. Like elsewhere in East Africa, the bus crew consisted of a driver, a conductor, uh, who was responsible for the fare, and a turn boy, uh, and sometimes an inspector, who could also be the owner. According to the interview with William's son, Samson, it was mostly Arabs who knew how to drive in the 1920s. By the time William's family decided to acquire a vehicle, Nashon, however, knew how to drive too. They acquired and refitted lorries with wooden benches and called them Kanyamuot 1, Kanyamuot 2, Kanyamuot 3, and so on. Those names were painted on the vehicles. Kanyamuot is a Luo clan name the family says they belong to. Within the Kanyamuot, they discern three subsections that live in different locations, but make up the clan together. This is what I have been told. The three groups need to be needed to be involved in the business uh, and were represented in the company. The chairman came from the subsection of the Bego, the treasurer from the Bungu, and the chairman was William, who represented the Odieng subsection. The passengers were walking to the family's home and stayed there overnight, eating breakfast before boarding the bus. People were walking long distances to get to the bus if they did not live roadside. Sometimes they walked over 20 kilometers. The bus route itself started near Nzoia Market and went to Kisumu where passengers could rest at another relative's house before proceeding to the railway station if it was their destination. In Luo culture, sojourners were a part of everyday life. From around 6 to 8 p.m., those residents who weren't involved with cooking were watching the gate to see if travelers would come to stay for the night. This time of the day is called Angich Welo in Doluo, 
vuelo, meaning both guests or to float in English. Even though no one knew they were coming, guests would be invited for supper and to stay for the night. Children born at this time of the evening could be, for example, then named Adiambo or Diambo, and it is said they move around a lot throughout their lives, indicating also a wandering spirit. The market in Zoya was apparently not the only reason for Nashon moving there and having the bus depot there. According to his children, he wanted to have a good distance between him and the rest of the family in the Sidendi Semenya area. He had been born to Luo parents in Tanzania, but his mother died after giving birth. So his father brought him back and his great grandmother raised him for the first five years of his life or so. Apparently it wasn't easy for Nashon um, when he returned to his father's place who had other wives who were not exactly welcoming. So from an early age, he went out and did odd jobs, fishing, walking cattle, and eventually becoming employed in Nairobi where his arrived boss who allegedly, admi uh, allegedly admired his work and offered him assistance in establishing this transport company. When he ran a successful business, he opted, however, to move away from his family to get a bit of distance between them and him. When the transport licensing started its work of issuing licenses in the late 1930s, Nashan was a certified driver licensed to operate multiple motor vehicles along various roads in Nyanza. When the Second World War broke out, transporters of South Asian descent seemed to have transferred motor vehicles to Africans who paid for the vehicles in installments and renewed the corresponding licenses. In this way, the transporters apparently sought to prevent the motor vehicles from being taken for the war effort, harnessing perhaps the paternalism the colonial government showed towards Africans. This narrative matches with a notice in the Kenya Gazette from 1941, in which Nashan changed the route of a vehicle which before the war in 1938 belonged to LB Sedani. Sedani, a member of the Hindu Lohana community from Gujarat, had a shop in Luanda and ran Luanda vehicles, owning at least six high capacity vehicles for passenger transport in 1938. Also in 1941, Nashon applied to renew another road service license, which suggests he had another vehicle of different provenance, possibly obtained from another arrivant. So in terms of the passengers, on the Kanya Mord bus. My interviews, in my interviews um, seem to point to, to the fact that overwhelmingly it was women who took those buses to trade, an activity they had also performed before the colonial period and continued after independence. So when men entered employment in, this early, early, in the early colonial period, women were increasingly left with overwork on the fields and in trade. For those women who were selling their own surplus produce at markets, bus travel possibly saved time and enabled them to at least uphold the scale of their previous mobility. 10 minutes to go. Oh. Right. Um, in turn, um, around the 1940s, some women are said to have spent a month or two um, in town after the harvesting was finished. Other women moved to urban areas permanently. A successful example is Theresia Ondik Ogaya, who left her home in Assembu for Kisumu, where she, a nurse by training, set up shops, bought houses, and married two women, paying full dowry, adopting children as heirs. Yet women were not only selling surplus. Nashon's wives were intermediaries and market traders who bought millet from Busia and sold it in Nzoia, Luanda, and Yala. For the same marketplaces, they also bought maize in Busia and Capsoid in Kiricho. Like other married women, their community didn't want them to move in an uncontrolled way. The ideas of respectability at the time forbade women to stay in lodgings or even eat at a restaurant while traveling. Thus, when national wives were buying and selling at markets, they were going there by bus and afterwards waiting for the bus to pick them up again. Sometimes they would even sleep roadside on their sacks of maize or millet, waiting for their transport. Since they traveled together and on their husbands' buses, this shielded them from accusations of being loose women, something that always threatened 
um, mobile women in the region. Generally, though, bus transport enabled Nyansens to move more healthily and safely than they did on the Uganda railway. At the railway station, African men could be asked for their vipande for proof where they were going. And on the train itself, Africans had to travel in overcrowded third-class compartments in unhealthy conditions. Norman Asemeyer showed for the 20th century that the fear of arriving sick um, kept men from choosing the train for transport instead opting to walk. In 1946, a conductor also made an African get off the train when she was traveling second class from Kisumu to Mombasa in her capacity as an ayah of a well-known Kisumu family with roots in Gujarat. Yet Nashans buses did not necessarily help Kanya Mord members to gain sovereignty over their mobility. Local representatives of the colonial state knew very well where they were going. The passengers' travel plans were probably known to the community and they likely had stayed at the chief's house overnight before taking the bus. So few non-white women were active in the transport of goods and passengers in Kenya within this period. But it was particularly women of Gujarati descent who were starting to drive cars in urban Nyanza. One of the first women to drive her own car was Kanta Patel in the mid 1940s. She was born in Mombasa. She married a co-director of a Kisumu Motor Works, a garage. And so she was very close to motor vehicles and also to the colonial state because Kisumu Garage could inspect vehicles on behalf of the administration. And a decade later in the 1950s, Driving cars was training amongst well-to-do adolescents who created a youth culture based on cars in Kisumu. The England-educated Zina Dramzan Chamal, for instance, liked to drive her car through the lakeside town. Young men would make sure they gathered in front of the post office where Jamal went in the evenings to drop off mail. Throughout Kisumu, the young adults would spot those who drove cars and refer to them in speech by their number plates. While the digits of the number plates became synonymous with people, they were far from hiding identities, rather signaling some kind of intimacy. But we have to think about that by the 1950s, driving for fun and corresponding car culture was of course a long established pastime for white settlers. Think safari drives or car rallies. Yet there was an important difference when compared to the mobilities of Africans and those of South Asian descent. White settlers could drive or travel in motor cars through the colonies and stop at distinguished whites only road houses, hotels, and private members' clubs. The Kisumu based motor trader John Riddock, for example, went regularly by car to the Yacht Club, where he was made a lifetime honorary member in 1956. The Scottish settler Riddock, well liked by the Kisumu business community, could access establishments and enjoy privileges that even the wealthiest of the Africans and racialized Africans could not. And therewith, I am um, reaching my conclusions. Though Africans built and maintained and financed the road and bridge infrastructure, the early motorable roads in Nyanza had seen no involvement of Africans in their deliberative stage. Africans were forced to work on roads, but were not involved procedurally. The process of becoming a certified driver, receiving vehicle licenses and commercial licenses was in the hands of white colonial administrators and the police. African men were barred from moving outside of their reserve unless for work, which indicated constrained mobility, sovereignty, and compelled mobilities. At the same time, it was these colonial or urban workplaces where African men could acquire knowledge about automobiles. In the first generation of transport companies, it is then unsurprising that African women were absent as mechanics and operators. However, African men's establishment as transporters was made difficult by racial hierarchies bureaucratic hurdles, and wages that were mostly too meager for obtaining a motor vehicle. When zooming in on transport operator National Ngebe and his family, we can see how obstacles were overcome. A combination of favorable aspects enabled the formation of Kanya Mord bus. The cohesion of the family and the clan, at least in the beginning, the attainment of automobile knowledge and skills, the possession of houses, friendships with arrivals, a strong rural mobility culture, as well as a beneficial relationship with the railways. The company owners proudly displayed their ethnic identity on the buses, making Kanyamot known more widely in rural land and beyond. Yet these buses drove through countryside and town where others had a more privileged position within the settler state. Gujarati women and youth, for example, who drove in the 1940s and 1950s, 
were well connected, affined workshops, and belonged to richer families. What enabled them to drive their own car was tied to the opportunities that arrivals in the intermediary position could access in the settler state. Automobility thus augmented the mobility of Africans and racialized groups in Kenya, but it did so in an uneven way. That was determined by intersectionality, first and foremost race, and to a significant degree by class and gender. Thank you very much. I hope I haven't overrun too much. On the next and last slide, you can see some of my references. Thank you. Wow, wow. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, uh, um, Alina, for that uh, uh, wonderful presentation. Um, uh, this is uh, an, a new area, like we, we have observed, um, and she has observed that uh, uh, mobility studies are, are, are a new phenomena uh, that uh, historians, anthropologists, uh, sociologists are actually trying to understand. And uh, this, uh, like, it's this emerging interdisciplinary field, um, as she has observed, explains the dynamic relationship between the, com um, the uh, combined movement of bodies, objects, and, and, and ideas. Um, the mobility studies, as she has demonstrated, uh, partly is, is the practice of movement and, and, and their representations. And, and Kamumot actually does uh, show, show this very well. Um, overall, uh, there are certain things that uh, Alina has, uh, has highlighted, and I would just want to mention a few, then I'll open uh, uh, this seminar to these uh, uh, participants and those present and, 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 and for colleagues and friends who are online. Um, one is the idea of when and how do people choose to move? Um, she has also talked about mobility sovereignty and I think this is quite an interesting uh, 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 concept there. Uh, in, in, in other words, there's a point at which people resist right, and want to find their own space to, to organize themselves in terms of how they move and how the choices they make in, in moving around. Um, in bringing this uh, discussion about the choice of um, when and how people uh, move and uh, again, uh, enjoying uh, mobility sovereignty, um, Alina discussed um, how colonialists in, in, in the context of uh, settler colonialism uh, found it easy because you know they were the dominant, the 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 the, uh, the ones who were in control. So they found it easy to move freely, as opposed to creating um, constraining circumstances which Africans were not able to move around. And uh, by creating through law, um, you know the aim was to monitor the Africans, control them, and, 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 and as they put it, uh, it, it, maintain law and order, because the aim was to con contain uh, Africans in, uh, in, one, uh, in one place. Um, there are a couple of questions that I think, based on your discussion, that I would wish to um, open. Before I go there, I, I think the aim then uh, generally Settler colonialism distorted uh, existing infrastructure, which which you have you have in, in infrastructure and technology um, by you know bringing new uh, new roads, new routes, uh, routes you know in travel, uh, etc. Um, but I, I, there are two or three questions that I, I wanted to uh, just to uh, start off the discussions. Um, one is what, what motivates uh, people, you know, Africans, uh, to question colonial ways of, 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 of mobility. 
what motivates, motivates Africans to question uh, to the extent that they, they also want to have their own automobiles, including the company that, uh, uh, that was created. Um, uh, what does the formulation, um, uh, or, or how does the formulation of Kanyamot uh, symbolize? What does it symbolize vis-a-vis -vis the control and domination of uh, asset like colonialism, right? How, what does it symbolize? Um, the third one is how, how successful was this mobility sovereignty? Uh, you know, if you take into consideration uh, Kanyamot. Then the last question that we want to consider is uh, what, what happened to Kanyamot? What happened? Really? Because uh, in histories, we engage in the issues of rise and, and, and fall. So what were, we don't hear of Kanyamo today, uh, just like we don't, we only hear, we, we have remnants of Kenya bus cooperation in Nairobi, but we knew, uh, we know that, in, you know, just immediate post-independence was, was still huge until perhaps about 2012, it was huge until they started, make, you know, operating as matatus, as opposed to the the big corporations. Uh, maybe you can start with that. Um, you can consider that, but we'll take a round of, of questions from the audience uh, present. Um, let's take the first round of questions. Uh, we'll take three, and then uh, she can also address the, the issues that uh, I have raised. Any, who's going to start us off? Uh, Dr. Mbongi? Um, Another one? Go ahead, Dr. Mbongi. I need to stand. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Alina. This is uh, a very interesting area of study. And uh, as, as, as you went on, I said, wow, uh, every day is a learning uh, experience. Um, uh, mobilities, uh, auto or social, and, and, and how, you, you know, Africans and Indians engaged uh, within certain uh, setups of mobilities uh, as a way of interfacing and engaging uh, with um, uh, the, the colonialists. Very, very, very interesting. Uh, but two, um, you know, small questions, uh, probably informed by my ignorance of the very complex uh, ideas that you are talking about. Uh, one is, um, you, you know, colonialism uh, is about, um, uh, you, you know, uh, control. It's about domination and uh, essentially it's about alienation uh, when you look at um, the Kenyan experience. And um, I, I was just wondering how um, uh, the, the idea or the phenomenon of mobility, whether it was auto or social, uh, um, that came to Africans who were at the lowest uh, uh, tier of the colonial hierarchy, uh, helped them to discover uh, new uh, horizons that will bring ideas of um, uh, uh, either ethnic or what one can see as um, nationalism, ethnic nationalism, or probably the such a concept as national nationalism, as it were, if, if you look at the different ethnic communities uh, in, in, in the country. Now, the second one is, um, you, you know, how did, um, you know, uh, mobility uh, enable Africans to engage and uh, interface in, in, in ways that bespoke of um, uh, their use of the cultural notions of patriarchy, especially uh, towards the end 
uh, when you, you were talking about um, uh, its influence on um, uh, society generally and relations uh, between, uh, uh, between genders. Uh, what happens to uh, literally rule by men uh, with increased uh, uh, you know, uh, mobility? Uh, with the idea of the automobile uh, that uh, destroyed the, the fairly insulated life of uh, a typical African African village. Thank you. <clears throat> we can't hear you. We can't hear you. We can't hear. <clears throat> Please put the sound up. We can't hear you. We can't hear the speaker. We can't hear you. That area bound by Fuludi River near Ndere Polytechnic, Kusawa Gogo, up there, then coming around the what we call uh, uh, the that secondary school onto the road. There are three communities there. The Kagola, if you take it up to Yala, the Kagola, the Kager, and Kanyamwood. And to add to the group I followed from Yimbo through their artworks, the abandoned artworks, which they left in 1600s into Sidindi. They extended with these people into Butere. And for a long time, that area we are talking about was under Butere. And it did surprise me when this lady was struggling with something within that. I know Ngewe, I know Ngewe family, I know Kanyamut, but uh, we are missing some background. What is the precursor of Ngewe? Have you heard of the Yang Chiu buses? This is a Chinese company which was given an overall permit in Nyanza to connect all the mining industries in Sakwa, in Kakamega, in Ramba. 
This is the same company which actually made the colonial government build so many roads and bridges. And some of the bridges are still there up to now. I have heard the, uh, the, 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 the criticism about, uh, you know, colonial government. These roads and the young Chiu transport opened Northern Nyanza and Central Nyanza. Kanyamut was an inspiration. But I, wa I want to say the capital investment inspiration in most of Northern Nyanza looks back into, looks towards the Asian employment and the Ugandan migration of those Luos who went to Uganda. Kanyamut, as you say, is true, got that from that. There is Kagola Bas from the same family of Kagola. That is a good family and all the rest. There was Korango Bas of Seme. And people who have heard of uh, a god or, or Migot, a, a dollar Migot or whatever. There was, um, and if you look at those buses of young Chiu, some of them who are drivers there, like Alaru Molu, like Utieno Goma, like Oluoko Valego, they came back to have their own buses. Awuj was a driver. Jauga of Seme, who formed the Korango bus, was a driver of that. So we must bring that, that background. Similarly, uh, I've been interested in transport in Nyanza because there is a lot of issues to concern. The last project I was doing was looking at how we can compare Nundu, which is a smallpox with coronavirus. And I found that the colonial transport was the major, major, major source of people traveling around spreading Nundu. But surprisingly, I was also digging, and I'm an archaeologist by training, I was digging at, uh, at Oguja side, which is near Oguja Bridge, and several bridges all across from Ugenya into, as Nzoya goes into the river. And some of those bridges were built by Africans. If you look at some of the, the, the masonry, at Ndere Ginery, at Ndere Polytechnic, at whatever, those Africans who are trained were the best masons. And those masonry cannot go flat within 10, five years like our houses today. I would have said a lot, but I came so that Alina can know me properly and we are research in arms together. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh for those uh, ideas and insights. Any other question? Second question? From the, the Indians and Uganda, you have also to think of what inspired, uh, inspired the others later on, uh, particularly the formation of the Thrift in 1945. That is what transpired other people like Ongewe. And it was the work of Jaramogi who are actually telling these people, don't go for colonial products. Form your own things. Do your own thing. And if you look at the, the, the background of these individuals with companies, they were either mechanics or drivers. If you look at the other, the other uh, background about them, there was a struggle in Kagola and Kanyamwood and Yiro families. That inspired some people there to say, we can do it better. And the Kagir was on the other side. So I'll give you a lot of information about that area later on. Thank you. Alina. <laughs> Thank you so much for these questions. Um, and comments. 
um, it's really good to get those inputs. Um, and I'm going to try to uh, give some answers to the questions. So I will start chronologically with uh, Dr. Gona, uh, who has asked what motivates people to question these white mobilities, automobilities. Um, and, um, and if they didn't, if Africans just didn't, or racialized others didn't just want equally your safari car to, as I, if I understand you, stood you. Yeah. Um, so um, that is actually a really good question. And it is one where I um, don't take that position that I think some people do, which is, oh, we just want to copy what we see. Um, when you look closely at what people are doing and what people are doing also in different regions within Kenya, then I find that it is always building on mobilities and culture that were there before. And that means that um, we get different kind of automobilities, monster motor vehicles come in. I give you an example. Um, people liked to travel communally. They did not really want to travel on their own. Culturally, you would be in a minority if you were attacked by a wild animal or you know any of this. So people were inclined to go in groups, which is perhaps not something that, that we can imagine with settlers who were sitting in their cars, going to Nairobi, going to some member step to, I don't know, have a drink with fellow settlers. Um, there were different ideas and understandings and different purposes. So while I understand that there is a process where, you know, for multiple reasons, people today um, are um, uh, tending to buy their own vehicles if they can, because let's face it, it might not always be very comfortable to um, queue up uh, at the Matatu stage at the station, um, wait for that bus. Uh, that might be crammed, that might be loud, that might be, you know, all these things. Um, and, and yes, that is true. But I don't feel like in this early period, um, there's an, an, an imitation that uh, is happening. I think it is much more in tune with people, were, what, what people were used to do and people, how they were used to move, which, by the way, might also be a factor um, when you look at this train travel like Norman Asamaya has done for that early period where men decided to just go in groups, just go together, just walk basically next to the train track rather than taking the train because the train, you would be, you, you could decide who was in your group, who was walking with you in the train. It was overcrowded and unhealthy. Um, so, so people really liked to seemingly like to continue with, with what they were, were used to. Um, that doesn't mean that it didn't happen on, on, on the same scale. I agree also with what Gilbert has said, and uh, I'll return to that later, that the scales, of course, were changed for, for multiple reasons. Um, and what does the formation of Kanyamwot symbolize? Um, that is a very uh, uh, good question. Um, well, I, I would say it's a symbol uh, for people um, making any kind of technology that comes in their, their own and um, adapting it to their needs. Doesn't look maybe the same way than a bus company uh, that was set up by the colonial government or with the help of it uh, looked like. No, it used private houses. Um, it used different concepts. It had sojourners, etc. But but for me, it, it is an example for how, um, how how people adapt things. And I want to stress that this I don't view that as a thing um, that doesn't happen in societies where technologies were invented. 
I think they're always translated. I think people always make them fit. So there's not a unique thing uh, in, in that sense. Um, perhaps that's, uh, that's one small answer I can give to that very big question. Then how successful was, was that mobility, sovereignty? Well, I kind of try to hint at it that for multiple reasons, you know, um, the Kenya mode uh, weren't like completely sovereign over their mobility. If they were traveling with this bus company um, that involved um, the wider subsections and families and clan and couldn't just go anywhere, which becomes very, um, very clear when you look at women, the women movement and how they were supposed to move and how they were not supposed to move, right? So all of these things um, apply and continue, um, even though there is now this African bus company. And yes, there were different other bus companies too. Um, so what happened to Kanye Mot? Um, Nashon died in 1975. Um, after that, uh, the bus company was still active. Um, it is also something uh, that happened already while he was still alive. He was giving buses to drivers that had worked for him. Um, and they started their own transport companies. This goes back to something that Gilbert has also just alluded to, that you had these shoot-off companies around. Um, and so there were very many companies, in fact, coming up that were inspired by what he had been doing. And again, he might have not been the very first. Um, but he was a very early one, in fact. Um, so I think that um, the last buses they had stopped operating in 1999. Um, so they continued and, and some sons continued. In fact, his daughter, um, who used to be an inspector in the 1970s on these buses, Mary, she uh, today works as a... Um, she has, she has retired officially, but she feels Matatu in Kisumu to Ahero. She is very active and she loves this job. She loves that transport sector. And she, she, you know, she will continue doing that. Um, and so I think there's all these things that continue going, going on from Kanyamot bus, even um, uh, after Ongewa's Death. And then I think you were hinting at the emergence of Matatu and of small, smaller buses. And I think here um, the landmark is uh, Kenyatta exempting uh, mini buses from being uh, regulated in 1974. This meant that people could start operating buses without having to have any of these expensive licenses having to deal with insurances, having to deal with all of these issues for multiple reasons. And, you know, these became then very successful. Um, however, there is still, for example, Nyaugenya bus in that region. That is also, you can also trace back to Kanyamot bus, which is very successful. And what they do is they have pioneered roads. They use these paths where people were walking and they put a big bus on them and they plied it for a month and they pioneered a new uh, bus route. Um, and that's how they kind of also beat the competition. It would have been on the Talmic road and you know, where you have other operators. So um, moving on to uh, Dr. Ombongi, um, he said that uh, colonialism is about control and alienation um, and in how far this bus company helped to discover new horizons um, for people. And I think that this is a process that, that, you know, of course, started earlier with like people moving to Nairobi, people moving to Mombasa for work, African men, um, but also then intensified. Um, and in the 1930s, you know, you couldn't really go to Nairobi uh, from Kisumu. That came later. So the standard of the roads had to had to improve. I mean, on, uh, with the motor vehicle, huh? unless you would go all the way up, etc. And around. Um, so uh, also, I think that the Second World War um, 
in many ways uh, also helped um, Miriam Musonia from the literature department and I, we have this paper where we look at the Italian prisoners of war um, building roads here in central Kenya, where for the first time, uh, Kenyans are actually seeing white people breaking stones manually and building this road, which is this moment again, apart from most people coming back from the Second World War, having seen that, you know, white people also do this work. That kind of things that was so curated by the colonial administration where, you know, it was pretended that that was not something that white people do, but then seeing that actually we're more or less the same, right? And we, these things, yeah, we all die and cetera, have pain and cetera. So I think this is, this is my very broad answer where I'm, I think I'm saying maybe it wasn't necessarily this bus company um, that, that broadened the horizon. Um, but at the same time, um, and this harks back to the other question that I've been asked, a lot of those transporters, a lot of those mechanics, a lot of those drivers in the 1950s also formed unions and become very active in petitioning the colonial government, saying, we want to have transport licenses, we want to have business licenses, um, and, and out of that comes this, this anti-colonial movement uh, is supported and bolstered by a lot of those drivers, and we know the unions that, that existed. Um, moving on to the question of um, cultural notions of patriarchy and relations between gender. So I think it is globally a very interesting phenomenon. How does the motor vehicle become so masculine? So masculine. Um, I, I'm not sure whether I can answer this question. I think it has something to do with men being exposed to the technology first, gaining knowledge, and then gaining hold over it to some extent. And then can you can see that very easily because they were employed in plantations, on settlers' farms, in, in, in places where engines were there and, and, and the technology were there. Um, uh, in terms of, and I'm not an expert there, and I really want to also have perhaps someone commenting on this, um, I, th I have the feeling that actually women become more controlled in that area from like the 1950s. So you, you yourself and your colleague have presented right in the, in the second to last session on women on top and, and women moving and going to the city, but also coming back and, and being, you know, some of them being relatively mobile. Um, and I think that uh, that is something that is much more controlled at some point when when there has been like a kind of a re-establishment of of the gender relationships between uh, yeah I, I'm not sure um, maybe I leave it at that um, and um, did I answer all of your questions yes, yes, yes. okay all right and moving on to to Gilbert Oteo who I want to preface, wanted to meet for an interview because I know that he's an expert <laughs> and you can see that um, uh, in his comment as well. And, and we're going to hopefully do that. Um, so um, the precursors of Ongewe. I have to honestly say that I don't have so much knowledge on what happened before the 1920s and particularly not with Africans. And that has also something to do with a gap in the archives because the Transport Licensing Board only starts off in 1937. So that's when you get the names for the first time. So you don't really know how long have they been there or anything like this, right? And then it also has to do with uh, me doing interviews. People do not remember so clearly unless they're perhaps experts in this and have worked on this, um, who was there in the early 1920s. And so I assume, and, and I think with young Chubas, that's something I really need to look into. I knew young Chubas because Oginga Odinga, the family took over young Chubas. They started Lolwe bus on the young two buses that had the actual vehicles. Um, and, and that's something I'm really interested in and I'm hoping to hear, hear, hear more from you. Um, and um, it is true that there were other transporters, some of whom were butchers, 
uh, had been owning a lot of cattle, which we all know is meaning that you have a lot of, um, you, can, you can turn it into money and buy things, right? These people who owned cattle were rich people. Um, and so some of them became butchers, they had lorries, they undoubtedly also transported passengers, even if, you know, they were mainly transporting their own goods. Um, so these are Mumbo, Achola, Migot, um, were all people. And then um, there was also Oluoch, uh, who uh, later on he established Baba Biro checkpoint bus. Uh, he came from the war. He, he had actually be, been returning from the war and was doing odd jobs and then being uh, working for uh, another African as a driver. He had actually received a, a driving license in the war. And so uh, he started that one and they were all very closely related to Ongewe. Um, and in fact, it's interesting you were saying this with that um, Ongewe was inspired by Lua's thrift or by, by Oginga or Dinga. I think that Lua's thrift, when it was established in the 1950s, was actually at a later point and Ongewe was already up and running. And I have heard the other story that, uh, that basically Ongewe was teaching Oginga Odinga on how to do business because he came from being a teacher and he was inspired by him later on starting his own bus company. So uh, I have not been able to speak to anyone of that family. If you have any contacts, please let me know. Um, I have no details on Lobe Bus, um, it, but I know it started off later and um, on, founded on the Young Shoe Bus. Um, I hope I have answered all the questions. Yeah. Uh, 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 Reginald uh, Odor, you have your, uh, you, you want to ask a question, please uh, unmute yourself. Thank you very much, Dr. Gona, and uh, thank you, Elena, for your presentation. I can confirm that I belong to the Kanyamut plan. And I can confirm that I come from Simenya. I can confirm that uh, Stephen Odur is my eldest brother, whom you interviewed. And uh, you have done a great job because these are my kinsmen and women. Uh, I know Ngewe's wives and Oluocho Tengo, whom you've just mentioned with um, Baba Biro. And, uh, all I would say is I don't know the framework of your work in totality, but yes, it would be helpful to look at, um, however briefly, the contrasts of the other um, bus companies like Kagola. Like Kagola people happen to be my mother's people as well, just the neighbors of, of Ongewe's people. Um, and I would say that uh, th those contrasts, uh, I guess, will be helpful if uh, if uh, if for no other reason to just ensure that um, the neighboring communities do not get the impression that uh, you overprivileged one one uh, group, but I can confirm that uh, even as uh, Ongewe was dying in uh, 1975, I was on holiday, and uh, it's actually my father who carried his body to the mortuary. So. Yeah, you are doing a great job. It happens to be a history I have lived through, traveled through those buses, and I encourage you to get on with it. I look forward to reading the final product. Thank you very much. There are people who have made uh, observations. Oh, Mary, Mary, go ahead. I, I unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lena, for that very interesting topic that you're dealing with. Uh, I am interested in the relationship between the evolution of the automobile sector and the social relationships of the people there and the economic status of the people in that region. Did it make an impact 
on their social and economic uh, organization or structure. If you look at them vis-a-vis -vis other communities that were not uh, particularly involved in such a, a sector. Thank you. Yeah, observations. Some of them are in uh, uh, in German, uh, and I, I hope you you come and sit and read them for yourself. Encouragements. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's see the others. Let's see the other observations so that uh, Alina can uh, absorb that. Um, these. I think this was a comment by Sharifa. Uh, V, mobility and the built environment is a very important intersection. Safety of women traveling and, and, and trading too. Thank you, Alina, for that. Mr. Roderick and my sister Zena's story too. All right. Um, Regin, Dr. Dole, oh, sorry, there's another one of uh, Abiero Opondo. African mobility was restricted by tough settler economy laws, such as Kipanda and other ordinances. May, was that there? Uh, oh, should have been many Luo and, and, and Luya preferred migrating to Uganda. That's, that's another one. Um, somebody was asking if they could permit uh, be permitted to record you uh, your, your presentation. Just at the bottom, there was a last uh, a comment. Just go below. This, uh, this was uh, Odor, actually. He said, better still, we will be taking live questions in a few minutes. So, so that that's was just a comment. Yeah. Uh, go ahead uh, to reply to Thank the you. question. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Odor, it is an honor that you have attended this presentation. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I'm really happy that that you know I, I was able to learn about that history of that place and that family, um, and uh, of course uh, I forgot to say that in response uh, just before um, I will also look at the other bus companies. Uh, this was a paper that was supposed to be a case study where I didn't want to complicate too much, but I wanted to zoom in on this one bus company in order for us to understand how the colonial state, the colonial settler state engendered these differentiated mobilities um, via laws, structures, and how people at the same time could overcome them. So in my um, PhD thesis, I will also look at, at, at other uh, uh, bus companies. Uh, it is not the sole focus. Uh, the sole focus is not on on, on national gateway. But yeah, thank you so much for for uh, attending here today. And um, Dr. Manioke, um thank you. That's a really um, important question um, about the social relationships and and um, how the bus company impacted on them, if I understood correctly, also perhaps economically. Um, I think that um, I'm always a bit hesitant with this because I think that a lot of it is actually continuity. A lot of social relationships have already existed, but it is undeniably the fact that once you can use a bus, you can also uphold them in a different way and you can create new relationships and this does also happen I mean we know this with drivers who have quasi familial uh, relations then along the the routes they are applying um, and so there's an extension over a wider scale um, but at the same point economically what what impact did that bus company have um, I think that impact was huge um, there's that other part of the uh, Kanya mode that, you know, went to Maseno school, uh, was very well educated, access to railways, etc. But they also really admired Nashonongeva, who had never gone to school, and he had become 
well, quite rich with this bus company and was able to do all of these things and to do this business. So I think we shouldn't underestimate like what impact that that had economically as well. Um, and then uh, Sharifa Kishafji, thank you so much for listening. Um, Sharifa is also one of the people I have interviewed, not just once, and um, and um, whose family is a very well-known family, or was a very well-known family in Kisumu. Um, and I gave the example of, of her sister, who was um, driving a car as a quite young woman in, in Kisumu in the 1950s. So. Um, then uh, we had uh, Mr. or Dr. Opondo, um, who was uh, saying that uh, Kipande restricted the mobility, and I, I, um, I totally agree. And um, and uh, yes, there are a lot of stories about um, those people who lived close to that colonial border. We also know that wasn't much of a border either. Um, opted to go towards Uganda if they weren't in agreement with something that happened on the, on the Kenya side, right? That didn't just happen with uh, Tikipan, it also happened when taxes were increased. Um, people were, of course, mobile enough to, to decide, okay, actually, I don't have to put up with this. Um, let, let me go on the other side. Uh, so I think, um, hopefully, I have covered all the questions and comments. Thank you. Thank, thanks, uh, thanks, Alina. Maybe something you could uh, consider, you know, as you uh, look into your work, is something that you mentioned uh, that happened in you know, the 40, 1940s of the Second World War, the transfer of licenses, trading licenses and, and bus company licenses from Asians to Africans. There's something similar that happens uh, with the Africanization in 1960, 67, 68, the, the Kenyatta regime. And there's a sign of Africans are given licenses by uh, Asians. So there's something similar that happens there. Maybe in terms of, um, you know, uh, correlating the information and, and seeing the continuity that you're, you're talking about. That could be quite interesting. Um, any other uh, question, concern, uh, so that we, okay. Um, let me take this. Thank you, Alina. Uh, you opened up a okay. good. Dr. Mong, you give us a lot of thanks and uh, uh, talk about uh, what uh, what's coming um, after Alina's uh, presentation this afternoon. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Gona, uh, for moderating uh, our session uh, this afternoon. Uh, Arina, this is uh, this is very interesting. I think uh, we probably need you more uh, to uh, excite our interest in um, the study of mobility. And uh, for for our students, those who are online, and a few are here. Uh, this is a new interesting area that uh, you really need to delve into, particularly for those of you who are looking for fascinating areas for, 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 for study. And I'm beginning to realize that, um, uh, you, you know, away from the mission education that we have always talked about as um, a change agent in colonial Kenya and, and wage labor, uh, mobility seems to be playing its role uh, alongside this very well. I, I get that impression. So we better shifted from mission education and wage labor and looked at how mobility was a very interesting uh, transformation uh, uh, agent uh, within uh, southern social species in Kenya's uh, uh, countryside. Very, very interesting. Uh, mine is to thank you uh, most sincerely for agreeing to come and speak to us and, and share your, your, your findings with us. 
and um, it's beginning to dawn on us that um, your affiliation with uh, uh, our department is yielding fruits uh, as I listened to you speak. Thank you very much and we are very humbled to have you uh, this afternoon. Uh, friends and colleagues uh, online and those who are here, we also want to appreciate you. This is for us all as we continue with uh, the conversation uh, in, in the academy and the historical discourse. We always appreciate your company and uh, your contribution. And most importantly, uh, our Mze, uh, I agree with you, there has been a transition in the department. Uh, the, the old generation is gradually moving out and leaving space for us much younger. And uh, 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 thanks for coming and we welcome you. We uh, are increasingly opening up uh, to the to the public uh, away from the ivory tower mentality that we have been blamed uh, for over the years. We, we welcome participation from different uh, quarters. In fact, uh, we are thinking that uh, in the next series of our seminars, we will uh, have uh, sessions that will touch on what we see as alternative knowledge. Uh, we want to listen to those uh, who are not from within the academy because uh, we believe strongly that they have something to contribute uh, in historical discourse. Thank you very much for, uh, for coming. Our uh, good people are helping us to cover this and run it online. We appreciate you, uh, my brother here and my brother there, Isaiah and uh, uh, Melvin. We appreciate you. And um, uh, Philip, our departmental reg uh, registrar, we appreciate for the logistics and all this is because of you. Uh, you know, uh, it is Napole Napoleon, the King of France, who once said, it is the service men and service women who fight in the battlefront. The generals are there to receive praise. So Philip, uh, we receive praise on your behalf, my brother. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, uh, very much. Our next um, seminar uh, will be on the 23rd of uh, this month in the same room and also online. We uh, especially welcome you to be with us. And uh, uh, on that day, we will have uh, one of our own, uh, David Masika. I don't know whether they, David was here, uh, talking about markets of war in Mount Elgon and asking a very fundamental question, who are the racketeers uh, in, in Mount Elgon uh, uh, war? And uh, this is a continuous conversation in a series we have entitled Re-Evaluating Archaeological Knowledge, the Minimalist State in Kenya and the Regeneration of Society. With those few remarks, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, welcome, and God bless you all.